Okay, hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth tutorial in IceCurve 2011. This is going to be about the cloud. It'll be following on in some ways from the discussion on interoperability and EID this morning. So if you're still burning to ask a question about that, um, you can wait for the question session in this one. We're um, aiming to leave 30 minutes at the end for questions. And as before, um, if you do want to tweet a question on hash IceGov, then that improves the odds of me reading it out or getting you to ask it. Okay. Uh, we're going to kick off with John Savage. I've never, I, I've always called you John in our conversations. John Savage, Savage, pretty close. Pretty close. Okay, um, who uh, <laughs> suggested that we introduce? We don't use more than three words to introduce everybody. Uh, and I cheekily said, uh, "So I'll introduce you as single point of failure." Uh, <laughs> Whether this is fair or not will become yeah. apparent during his <clears throat> talk, although you can also read his bio in the program. John. Oh, thank you. Oh, my title slide seems to have found a new home. But uh, thank you. Uh, today, the objective that uh, I have and we have as a, as a group is to bring everybody in, and by the end of the session, everybody will be able to at least be able to talk and understand the basic building blocks of cloud computing and some of the implications that has with uh, e-government and, uh, you know, government systems. Uh, myself, I come from the, the area of building data centers and having supported uh, quite a few uh, cloud computing companies in the early days and in the later stages of what are in the, in the commercial public cloud sector and uh, have a, quite a bit of experience in uh, the good and the bad of cloud computing. Uh, but to set up the conversation, I'm going to touch on two topics. The first is data center consolidation, and the second is uh, disaster recovery and business continuity. As two areas that have really driven cloud computing into both the public and private sectors. Uh, I'll go on to do a basic intro to cloud computing 101 course. Briefly introduce a Moldova case study of what we've done, and Mr. Tirkana will uh, follow up with a more detailed uh, discussion on Moldova, and finally touch on a few uh, government roles in cloud computing. And to start it off, uh, a lot of things happen day to day when you're in the technology business. And myself, I'm an engineer, so I focus on slightly different things than policy. But things that happen to me day to day is I have to consider the data centers that we operate today, whether they're efficient, whether they're not green, they're wasting money, um, geographically untenable. Um, business continuity and disaster recovery issues, and what's really driving a lot of the cloud computing discussion is that now we're really entering a technology refresh cycle for some of the systems that we've had for 5, 10, or 15 years, and now those systems are no longer supportable, and marrying that or connecting that to the idea that applications on cloud computing and virtualized systems are really creating a new enabling platform that governments and private industry can use. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic that's happening today. But I'm going to start off and talk about the need for consolidating data centers as one step in the road to uh, cloud computing. Even in the US where I'm from, um, a year and a half ago, we came up with this idea that we had more than 1,100 data centers supporting only the central government in the US. A lot of those were server closets. A lot of those were not really documented very well. But the, the US government said, we really, really have to take a look at how much money we're spending to support more than 1,000 data centers for every little agency the government has and find a way to consolidate that into 12 or 18 or less than 20 data centers and make more efficient use of data, as well as you know, be able to implement greener technologies and uh, much more efficiency. Not just the U.S. government, the Australian government also. Um, you know, they have now a vision that all of those individual data centers, servers under desktops, server closets, really they should be in, in, in braced into a whole of government idea of how do we actually handle data and how do we actually handle, handle applications uh, within the government. 
And the idea again that we're in a technology refresh cycle, technology is changing very quickly and the software that rides on that technology is changing very quickly. And the idea of uh, consolidating data centers makes a whole lot of sense. When we look at a traditional data center that an individual office or agency has versus a consolidated data center, there's some things that really stand out that we'll talk about a lot more in a few minutes. For example, the average utilization of an IT infrastructure in a single traditional data center is somewhat way less than 20%. For example, everybody's laptop computers, desktop computers, servers, um, shared storage devices. If you look at what you have in your own computer, you probably have a 500 gigabyte hard drive and you're probably using 100 gigs of that unless you, you know, store a lot of movies and things like that. Well, that's actually a lot of cost from taxpayer money that's going in to buy all that excess capacity. And now we're looking at how we can recover some of that capital expense and uh, return it to uh, productive use. And when we went into, and th this is actually the first slide of what we did in Moldova. Uh, when we first went into Moldova and looked at what we could do to create a more efficient environment in Moldova. The first thing that I did was I started doing surveys of every government ministry agency that would allow me in the door, as well as most of the private sector within uh, Moldova. And we found a lot of really interesting things like very little of the infrastructure was actually using modern sustainable hardware and sustainable software. We actually had quite a few agencies that had live government data that were running on old PCs that were on a desk, had absolutely no storage or, um, or backup devices, and were running old software like 1990s versions of Fox Pro for databases. Obviously, that's not you know, going to meet the needs of the 21st century. Um, but really, you know, the two things that stand out are, you know, what, what are you gonna do if one of those old PCs crashes a hard drive and there's no backups. This is another country, actually uh, Indonesia, uh, where I did a similar study and went through, I guess it was probably 45 different agencies in Indonesia. And we were rating, you know, in my judgment, and definitely a subjective judgment based on my data center uh, experience, and very few agencies within Indonesia actually came up with what I would call an acceptable standard of supporting their data or supporting their operations. And in fact, the only one, if you see the green there, the only one that actually I gave a passing score was a private company. Uh, all of the government uh, agencies, with the exception of the Ministry of Finance, actually uh, received overall marginal or something less than acceptable scores. But not all IT managers in those organizations were very happy about the idea of potentially losing their server closet or losing control over their data. And it's not just confined to Indonesia or Moldova or you know, any other uh, country that's in the developing world. This is a survey that was taken by um, a US organization called the National Association of State Chief Information Officers. And in the US, IT managers also aggressively resist anything that has to do with consolidating and losing power over their data centers. In fact, the most common response to why an IT manager um, or, or why a, an agency would not consider consolidating their data centers and data into a centralized uh, location is that they just don't want to change. They want to you know, remain autonomous. They do not want to give up um, you know, their internal processes and, and how they do things, and they don't like transparency. Um, pretty much the same in every country that we've looked at. The second big area, you know, talking about, uh, you know, the surveys that we did is, of course, disaster management, and disasters do happen. Um, and I'll give a couple of examples. This is not a government example. This is a large telecom facility in Seattle, Fisher Plaza. Uh, three years ago, they had a bus duct, an electrical bus duct explode and took the facility out for about two weeks. Very large companies using that, uh, content distribution networks, telecommunications companies, all of, those all of those people using Fisher Plaza 
uh, were with, they were just completely out of the network for about two weeks. This picture here that shows a you know, fairly well-damaged, disintegrated bus duct is in my own facility, which was uh, one Wilshire in Los Angeles, which many people believe is the most uh, densely interconnected telecom facility in the world. We had a 4,000 amp bus duct explode right next to the meet me room where more than 400 carriers interconnect. Disasters do happen. You have to plan for it. Fortunately, our backup systems all operated and the world never knew it happened, but uh, in a disaster like either one of these, global communications could have been set back quite a few years. And there are a lot of directives that help us uh, with disaster recovery planning. But the whole idea of how we're operating data centers means that if we're responsible for data that belongs to the people of the country that we're paid to support, we have to be able to protect that data. So the main objectives of the disaster recovery plan with the data center consolidation plan and as we talk about how this fits into cloud computing is how do we safeguard the data that we're responsible for when a disaster happens, not if, but when the disaster hap happens, how quickly can we respond and how quickly can we, we restore uh, operations. And as we continue talking about cloud computing policies and standards, we'll try to find answers to those questions. So now is the fun part for me as an engineer, uh, you know, as a technology person, I love cloud computing. It is just a, you know, it's, it's a great thing, but it's actually not just for geeks, it's actually a very important thing. Um, a lot of people believe, including those in, the, in, in my own government, that it's one of those items where you can run but you can't hide. It's like internet email. In 1990 and 1985, if you had an, a business card that had an email address on it, people would look at you like you were nuts. Why don't you just put a fax number on there? Why are you messing around with this email stuff? Things will change. Time develops ideas and time develops technologies and cloud computing is going to happen. Uh, but we have to start preparing for it and with any technology refresh or any point in an innovation cycle that things are changing very rapidly, there will be trouble of standardization and there will be a requirement to uh, you know, plan for that. There's a lot of different definitions for cloud computing. Um, if you put your name on one of these definitions, you will find people who will object to that and will find you know, a, a reason to say that's not the right definition. But most people in the U.S. now and many other countries are actually following the NIST, which is the U.S. Uh, National uh, Institute for Standardization and Technology. They're starting to follow the NIST guidelines because that really is the only national guideline that has been put out into the cloud industry and uh, the rest of the world uh, appears to be following that as well. And as we continue getting ready to think about cloud computing, today, and, and this is from uh, various sources, I, I collect data a lot and put this graph together. Generally, about 53% of the cost of IT is in hardware, data centers, and something that actually does not manipulate ones and zeros. About 11% of that is in applications development or setting up new applications, and the rest of the 36% is in maintenance of existing systems. Our intent with cloud computing is to begin relieving IT managers and organizations of the burden of maintaining hardware, facilities, and other pieces of equipment that do not actually directly contribute to the operation of your organization or company. And we talked about above the clouds, the Berkeley um, study a while back, this is actually from above the clouds, where Berkeley had, a, a, this is a very good graphic where they will say that, and again, I was talking about, you know, your desktop computer that may have a 500 gigabyte hard drive, you're using 100 gigs of it. Well, overall IT follows that same kind of concept where we actually have to buy and plan our equipment to meet peaks in our demand and usage. So if this top of the bell represents a peak of IT systems demand, us as an organization, we have to buy capacity or provide capacity that always exceeds that demand 
Whereas we start talking about cloud computing, our objective is to only have a requirement to use capacity and acquire capacity that matches our demand cycle. And to put this in another graphic, let's say if in our organization, or our, our, we have five different agencies, and those five different agencies all buy similar IT systems with the same amount of capacity, it's likely that none of those agencies are going to use all of the capacity that they've bought. So thus, you're still operating five systems, facilities, electricity, air conditioning, people, all those things that are required to drive these facilities, when in reality, when we start talking about virtualization and being able to pull resources together and allocate those based on need, we may be able to eliminate, in this case, uh, in this representation, 60% of uh, what our overall capacity is. That's the objective. So the next few slides uh, are a little bit wordy, uh, and I will back those up with graphics in a couple of moments. But uh, these are words that you're going to continually, continually hear in any discussion on cloud computing. And again, these are terms that are provided by the NIST, or the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, but have been broadly adopted around the world. And those, those characteristics that we're going to look at to be able to match demand and IT capacity are the ability to have on-demand service. Everything that we do today runs on a network, so we have to be able to provide broadband um, and be able to provide that to users as well as to connect machines together. We want to be able to take resources, multiple individual resources, and make them look like a single resource. We want to be able to have access to compute and storage capacity when we need it and give it back when we don't need it anymore. And we want to be able to build for it internally uh, you know, as a cost center or if you're providing it as a private or a public cloud service, you want to be able to get paid for the service that you're offering. These are probably the three most common terms that you'll see when we're talking about cloud computing. And it starts kind of building the infrastructure from the ground up. We talk about infrastructure as a service. In very simple terms, that means being able to virtualize hardware resources where, for example, you may be able to take 100 individual servers and to the infrastructure as a service, it looks like a single resource. So instead of having a one gigahertz processor, now you have a 100 gigahertz resource. And the same thing applies to storage and other things. Platform as a service, in the most simplest terms, is when you're able to take that virtual pool of resource and put operating systems on top of that to be able to build what I'll call a virtual data center capacity. And on top of that, we have, finally, software as a service, which is what the user eventually will access. If you're familiar with Gmail or Yahoo Mail or Google Apps, that would be classified as software as a service. NAST has broken down um, several different cloud deployment models, and we've recently added a, um, a fifth deployment model. But at the most basic, a single organization that does not want to share resources with other organizations, but does want to be able to create a single resource pool for their own organization, would use what we call a private cloud. It means that it's a cloud resource, but it doesn't actually share that resource with other users outside of the organization. A public cloud is something that you go and buy. You can take your credit card and go to Amazon or Microsoft or Google or Layered Technologies or somebody like that and buy compute capacity. That's a public cloud. A hybrid cloud is when you have a private cloud, but you want to also be able to access additional compute and storage resources if your requirement or application requires you to go outside of the boundary or the threshold or limits that your private cloud has. A community cloud is when you have several different organizations that have a similar mission or sim a similar way of doing business, and you want to be able to share resources within that community so you can connect different clouds together that share a single uh, uh, common goal, and we'll call that a community cloud. And the final is what we'll call an intercloud, which doesn't exist today. 
but we're trying through standards to be able to standardize the infrastructure and platform as a service, which would allow full interoperability and portability between cloud vendors and manufacturers, or cloud vendors specifically. And if we put that all together, uh, this is one way to look at it. So you have the characteristics that are common to all clouds. You have essential characteristics, service models, and then uh, some cute clouds on top that uh, give us an idea of individual private community and public clouds, and then uh, connecting them all together into a hybrid. The next several slides will hopefully graphically represent what I just gave you in the architecture and the framework, so it'll be a little easier to visualize. As an engineer, I kind of live on a whiteboard, so visual support is uh, important to me. But if we look at all these cabinets here, I'll say these are all processors. It may be blade servers, it may be a bunch of individual uh, small servers, but our intent is to take 100 servers and to the resource, make it look like a single resource that can be allocated as we need. The same thing applies to storage. Instead of having a one terabyte storage array, now I'm gonna put a thousand of them in there and now I have a petabyte resource, a single petabyte resource that I can allocate as needed. I need to be able to manage that. On top of that, I need to be able to build operating systems and build environments. On top of that, I need to be able to prepare individual applications and present that to end users. And here's a graphic representation of how you might be able to do that. So, and this is uh, some friends of mine at a company called 3Terra uh, provided this to me. Um, if I look at this stack, we'll, we'll consider today that everything behind this is what we'll call infrastructure as a service. So behind this, I have all this mess back here. So I have this huge compute resource, a huge storage resource, and it's managed. The next thing I want to do is to create objects. I want to be able to create operating systems. I want to be able to create virtual switches, routers, firewalls, servers, all that type of stuff. And I build those in objects that the infrastructure as a service will be able to identify. So I need to have a couple of uh, Linux boxes. I need three Linux boxes. I can go up there and grab a Linux icon, plop it down into this board, put in some characteristics of how many CPUs I want, how much memory I want, what kind of bandwidth I think it's going to need. I can set up all those attributes and plop those three servers down and the platform as a service function will create those servers within the infrastructure as a service pool of resources. If I want operating systems, I'll go back and say, well, I want these to be Linux boxes, make sure it's Linux. I want to switch, I can say, okay, this is a virtual representation, representation of a 12 port switch. I'll drag that switch in there and plop it in there and take lines and connect the servers to that switch. I'll put a router up here connect the switch to the router, face that into a network. If I need to, I will start putting database images on top of those servers. And that's what platform as a service will allow me to do. All in, the, in a matter of, if you know what you're doing, just a matter of a few minutes, what you have done is created a virtual data center. So rather than having 100 square meters of let's say 150 kilowatts per square foot or you know 1200 kilo, kilowatt or 1200 watts per square meter and having people that are required to go in and put servers in worry about hard drives failing now the IT manager just needs to know what he really needs as a data center he create takes those objects makes sure he has enough capacity and creates himself a data center and to the end user it doesn't look like anything other than now I know the IP address of a server. In fact, all of this is connected both with IPv4 and IPv6, if you're familiar with uh, the internet routing protocols, and looks like a virtual ethernet connection. Another graphic representation of that where here is your infrastructure as a service, and we're creating virtual data centers on top of that. 
in a single facility rather than 20 or 30 facilities. Management, I need to know out of all that infrastructure how much I'm using. I need to be able to meter it and plan for it. And for the end user, the end user might see that as a, as a Microsoft Office 365. It might be a, a Google Doc. Could be Yahoo Mail. Could be a WordPress blog. The end user really doesn't care. They don't care whether it's coming off of a physical server or whether it's been created within a virtual cloud. To the end user, all they want to use is their application. One of the, what we consider one of the most powerful applications today is uh, virtual desktops. Again, the same thing that applies for servers where you're not using much of the capacity as a server also applies to individual workstations and laptop computers. The reality is today that we use workstations and laptop computers because we want them, not because we need them. All of the applications that you can do on your laptop computer, with the exception of some graphics programs, um, CAD, Visio, things like that, you can pretty much do off of a virtual desktop. And uh, that, I would submit, is probably 90% of everybody in a government organization is using email, word processing, presentation software, spreadsheets. And if that comes off of a central cloud-based system, they would never know the difference. So to start wrapping up the first part of the cloud discussion, um, NAST also has additional priorities to add on to that great cloud infrastructure. Um, it's interoperability, portability, and, and uh, security. So while cloud is a great thing, it's, it's, as you continue to think about it and study about it and start seeing it implemented within your own countries and organizations, there are still three items there, interoperability and portability and uh, security, that have not been solved yet and uh, still needs work. A final representation when we're talking about disaster recovery, uh, and again, this is in the context of Moldova that we created this model, is that with clouds and having adequate broadband access between a primary and a backup data center, we are able to easily store an image of all applications that are contained in the primary data center, and we're able to image or create backup images of uh, data that's created within the cloud system through the network. In this case, we're showing that as an incremental change or a mirroring change in data, we're actually just changing data that's uh, been modified instead of you know, recreating files, um, and the ability to reduce a recovery point in a recovery time to near zero, uh, we believe that uh, with when this architecture is implemented, it will uh, you know, meet the needs of the government. And if the government has a catastrophic failure, that we will be able to restart the government with uh, very little uh, pain. The next section, two more sections of my presentation, are some issues and concerns. Um, we talked about portability and interoperability, and that will be also discussed a little further later, and it's actually, you know, I think three sessions uh, within the uh, IceGov conference are on interoperability and portability. But we're going to talk more today to open up the discussion on security, which will be discussed further um, later in, in today's presentation. Um, with clouds, while we believe as an industry, as engineers and technicians, that cloud is secure and is safe, you're putting a lot of trust in us as engineers that we're actually protecting data at the same level that we claim we are. Of all the issues with cloud computing that government IT managers have, security today is by far the biggest concern. Um, a lot of things, portability, implementation costs, you know, flexibility, customization, availability and performance, they're all a lot less of an issue than security is. And particularly with, uh, you know, privacy data, um, you know, what we're going to do with remnants, you know, if, if the elasticity of cloud allows us to grab capacity when we need it and give it back when we don't need it, what happens to the data that's in that area that's been given back? So, 
there's a lot of issues that we're dealing with, uh, you know, with the data remnants and, you know, uh, how we're going to manage privacy, the geographic location of data. Uh, in a country like the U.S., it's not as big a deal because it's a big country, and within the country, we have lots of data centers. In smaller countries, it may not be as easy to handle if you have disaster recovery and backup requirements. Um, but those are all issues that uh, we'll talk about more as the presentations go along. Probably of all the issues that we have with government, uh, as we start getting into this technology refresh cycle that will pretty much induce the public and private sectors into considering virtualization or cloud computing, probably the biggest role that governments have is in the idea of thought leadership. Um, and we'll talk about this in the, in the context of Moldova a little bit further, but when we first went to Moldova to look at the country and see what it would take to implement a cloud platform, the first thing we realized is that very few people within the country were actually familiar with cloud to the point where we could discuss it on a policy basis or discuss it on a, a future development basis. So the first several months that I spent working in Moldova um, was more of a teaching exercise where we had to actually bring people up to the knowledge level that was required before we could actually seriously engage in discussions of what cloud computing might be able to do for the country. And once we got to that threshold, the discussion was very easy. And all of those resistors that initially told us no way will our agency even consider virtualization or cloud computing, after we completed that education process, most of those arguments uh, started going away. The government has to make that vision available, not only internally, but also you know, to the public sector. And another thing that I'm not going to talk about in detail today, but when you start talking about reducing, again, 1,300 data centers into 20 data centers, the impact on the environment and how much electricity you're using and how much water that you're using, all of those impacts are huge and uh, you know, environmentally. Uh, cloud computing also makes a whole lot of sense, um, but I won't read these one by one. Uh, it's, it's easy enough to see, but uh, it's, it's really the vision is to create a secure government computing pool of resources and to uh, um, drive government agencies into using that and to feel comfortable in using those pooled resources. Getting back into the pre um, preparation for the Moldova discussion, uh, after we were able to complete the thought leadership process, the next major phase that we had to go into was to actually create statistical data and create real survey data to show exactly where we were today, what the risks, what the opportunities were to consider cloud computing, what it would take organizationally and knowledge-wise, not only in the universities, but in, in the public sector and the government, what it would take to bring everybody up to the point where we could actually then make a, a, an intelligent decision on how to go forward. And that cloud readiness assessment, I believe, was one of the more uh, useful tools that we had. And uh, you know, if, if you're interested in that, um, ask me later, or Oleg Petrov from the World Bank is going to be here shortly. Uh, you can ask him, since uh, he's pretty much driving that. Um, but Moldova was interesting. Moldova, again, a, a recently democratized country. Um, a lot of um, legacy systems in place, a lot of very well-educated, smart people in an economy that's begging for a way to get moving, and a government that's looking and, and trying to find the best way to uh, create an environment to allow that to happen. So when we started talking with uh, Moldova, and mCloud, by the way, stands for Moldova Cloud, the requirement was to try to get all of those old legacy high-risk systems eliminate those and to try to create a government-wide shared pool resource that any agency in the government, whether it's central, whether it's the Ryan, or whether it's the local level uh, in the country, would be able to take advantage of those resources if they wanted to. Um, we looked at all of what we've talked about today, uh, you know, the, the, the business continuity disaster recovery surveys. We did a very detailed cloud readiness assessment. Uh, I interviewed probably 
every IT manager in, in, in the ministries and uh, most of the commercial or public uh, companies in Moldova and codified all that into a very good feasibility study for the country, which is, you know, which is now being executed, which uh, Mr. Turkanu will uh, explain in a moment. And we're at this uh, line right here, right now. Uh, mCloud is now out for bid. The leadership is fully engaged on cloud computing within Moldova. Um, we were able to build what we'll call a cloud-first policy, which means that now during technology refresh cycles or when individual ministries or agencies are going to need to increase their IT capacity prior to approval of acquiring equipment or IT or software to do that, you will have to pass a question of can you do this in mCloud? And if you cannot do that in cloud, in mCloud, then you have to create a justification of why you will not use cloud computing for that specific application, hardware purchase, or uh, system that you want to establish. Um, and if you look at a graphic representation of what mCloud is going to look like, again, a central data center where we have compute, storage, communications, all of the resources that you would have in all of the different ministries that are there today, but in a single location. Riding on top of that, quite a few different applications that come from an application store that is being built for mCloud, meaning that if you need a Linux image, you can get a Linux image. If you need to create a VOIP or an IP PBX, we can drop an IP PBX into mCloud and create a telephone system Connecting that through communication systems that are available to all points in Moldova today, whether it's fixed line or wireless that touches all parts of the country, not only for government users on a dedicated access, but also through internet networks for citizen services and for remote users. So we believe that using, you know, Moldova and Indonesia and Vietnam and other countries that we've worked in on similar topics, we believe that uh, there is no reason not to start considering cloud services in, in a country or a public business. Um, even if it's small pilot projects to take advantage of disaster recovery or take advantage of shared email systems or, or simple systems, there's no reason not to consider using cloud today because as a technology, we believe um, it is going to be the future. Um, everybody believes that cloud computing and shared resources will be part of the future. Just a couple more slides and I'm done. Um, we need standards, we need to provide as governments, not only standards for our own internal users, but also to provide uh, guidance to the industry. We don't want to make everything a standard. We want to have a standardized core set of services that allow interoperability and portability of data, but we also want to encourage innovation that allows software companies and IT managers and people to be able to use the core capacity of a cloud system and to create new and better things and you know, continue with uh, you know, the, the technology development cycles. There are a lot of standards. It's gonna be very confusing. Um, everybody is now trying to develop a cloud standard. Most of us still follow the NAST or the NIST guidance. NAST is trying to get their arms around all of these different standards and put it into a single place that software vendors and hardware vendors and uh, other people can use as well as users. Um, but it's, it's going to take time. Um, the internet today, uh, you know, if I could be so bold as to say, if you ask everybody in this room to tell you what the internet standard is, that we'll probably get a hundred different answers. So even the internet today is not 100% standardized. NAST has also tried to create a picture that's called a, a reference architecture, putting all of those things that we talked about today, the service layers, how you put it together, security, privacy, you know, what will happen when we try to look at hybrid clouds and, uh, um, you know, community clouds and things like that. 
we're trying to put those into reference architectures that will change over time because technology and you know, innovation, everything changes over time. But we're now trying to put that into a picture that uh, we can all understand. And this is again subjective just on my part as the final slide. Um, I believe we're right here. We haven't got to the point where we are able to open our clouds up and to interconnect clouds where we have true uh, uh, interoperability. Realistically, I think that we're right here, some, somewhere between uh, private clouds and being able to uh, go out into a hybrid. And with that, I will pass on the baton. Thank you, John. Sure. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, an unexpected slight delay, but um, I wonder... John, do you fancy taking a question while we uh, wait for this? Let's not waste this moment. Does anybody have a surprise question? Hang on. Uh, I have a... Uh, Georgi George, uh, from Georgia. Yes. Uh, it, it is considered any offline mode for this cloud computing. Offline mode. I'm sorry? Uh, it is considered uh, offline mode for the, the cloud co computing. Offline. Yeah. In case of uh, service not availability and so on. An offline mode for cloud computing? Yes. Um, no, uh, the, in this model, uh, very important is connection. Yes. Mm -hmm. If uh, oh yes, yeah. I mean, in some cases, in some cases, maybe the connection interrupted, and in this case, uh, maybe client uh, should have the ability to, um, I don't know, uh, offline operation and so on. Yeah, and, and and with cloud computing, I mean, today again, we're not to the point where all of us will have connections 24 hours a day, all the time, regardless of where we are. So today. If you're accessing a system that's, let's say, an e-government system, the intention is not to have that as an offline system. The intention is to have remote access to a centralized application. But if we're talking about a desktop application, no, no, you know, where you need a word processing document, yeah, some in some case. And today, as we sit here, all systems that create VDI documents allow you to store an image of that document on a local computer. All of them that I've used, anyway. Sorry yeah. if that did that, yeah. if that helped. No, it did. I think it was very relevant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's so. Uh, our second speaker, Francisco Garcia Moran, from the EC. Based on the, on the speech by John, I found a very good tutorial. I'm going to tell you a little bit of the mic. You stand here. I have to switch it on. Okay, perfect. So uh, I wanted to to go through what we call the, the European Cloud Computing Strategy, if any, that uh, is uh, included as uh, one of the actions in the European Digital Agenda. I spoke about uh, this morning while presenting the interoperability and EID from the European perspective. So. On the definition of all clouds, <laughs> there was a, a group uh, created by the Director General for Information Society uh, of experts in cloud. And they came up uh, with, a with a definition, and this is the problem of the definitions. Uh, first of all, there are too many, and uh, the second is that uh, some of them uh, you don't even understand. So they came up with that, and when <laughs> creating the slide, uh, we discovered that uh, it didn't mean a lot uh, for uh, people who, for, for the normal people. So uh, was uh, tough. Uh, so I decided that the best uh, one was uh, the one that uh, was used uh, by John before, coming from uh, NIST. So it's uh, the model and it's uh, the on-demand. It's a share pool of all resources and, and all the blah 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 that is around that. But uh, my problem was that my commissioner who is a politician, diplomatic background, in charge of IT, said to me, well, okay, explain that to me. 
And even with those definitions, uh, things are way at up. So I decided to make a joke. And uh, I did this one. So you are in the clouds uh, when it rains. <laughs> when it's not raining, <laughs> it's, uh, you are in the sun. And uh, you have both, uh, you have the rainbow. The guy didn't understand the word, but uh, we had a lot of laugh together. So I <laughs> just had to say to you that uh, selling uh, the cloud to the politicians uh, with that name and everything that is behind is not a simple thing. OK, right. Uh, so uh, I stop uh, joking over here, and I go for very serious uh, issues. First of all, we really believe that uh, the cloud is going to progress. And uh, this is uh, what uh, the mayor kind of uh, consultancy companies see about the cloud uh, in the future and the distribution base on the kind of cloud services uh, you can expect and that uh, were very well presented by John uh, a few minutes uh, ago. So yes, even for 2012, there is uh, a lot of millions uh, in the game uh, over there and people are pushing a lot uh, so that uh, public administration and the private sector are going for the cloud uh, as soon as possible because uh, we need business to make uh, Europe uh, grow. So. In the digital agenda, it said clearly that we should uh, develop a European-wide strategy on cloud computing for government and science. And we were pretty restricted there. Quite a challenge itself. As a matter of fact, one of the questions that we ask ourselves is, uh, do we need any kind of European-wide strategy on cloud at all? And this is uh, what we are going, uh, going, we are going to, to, to discover in the coming months. We have a number of challenges. Some of them have already been uh, mentioned uh, by, by John a few minutes ago. I was in a meeting uh, on the first week of uh, September together with uh, other director generals, uh, and I'm going to give you the landscape of people that were there. Director General for Justice, about uh, data priva privacy and, uh, and data protection. Home Affairs, about law enforcement. Industry, because of uh, small and medium enterprises at cloud suppliers, or cloud consumers. They were the people in charge of, in enterprise, in charge of standards. They were my director general in charge of uh, interoperability and many others. It means that, that cloud have a lot of things uh, to study before we go full strength. So that will be gradual. Second thing is that there is a mystery in this, uh, in this issue of the cloud. There are a number of uh, new things that have appeared basically with a virtualization, with a broadband uh, available everywhere, high speed, with uh, the, the, uh, the movement to data center consolidation. But all that is on top of something that already existed uh, for some time, is outsourcing. So there are a few cloud examples, most, uh, mostly uh, public clouds, but it's not new. Any, nothing is uh, new over here. It's an incremental progress uh, like uh, any other things. You remember that uh, when the, the web, the, the, the WWW was born, Internet already existed uh, for nearly 20 years. <laughs> so we didn't discover anything. We just found the paradigm that uh, made it explode. So on interoperability, it's essential. It's going to take time. It's going to cost a lot of effort. It's going to, to, to cause a lot of discussion, but uh, it's essential if we want to be to have choice. And interoperability is here for choice. And uh, data portability is uh, one of the major preoccupations. Today, in reading on the internet the news, uh, on the, the Spanish newspapers, I read a news uh, that said the French government is going to invest uh, 138 million on creating their own cloud. Why? with uh, the participation of the private sector, because uh, data portability is no thanks. So this is the picture as is seen by the government. I was uh, presenting this kind of ideas in one uh, meeting in, uh, in Spain in, uh, in February this year. Everybody spoke about virtualization. Nobody spoke about for very, very, very uh, um, set for very exceptional services, such as uh, public uh, dissemination, uh, information dissemination about implementing uh, cloud, public clouds into the government. A lot of people spoke about uh, private clouds. So, I mean, there is a fear there that is important. A standardization. <laughs> It's already complex. Uh, in general, imagine for something that is uh, completely new, that is even behind the scenes. Those uh, who thought that uh, this, the captivity or the locking was concentrating on office automation pro uh, products or database uh, products. Now, what you see behind, 
you don't know what is it. So the locking has increased one layer, and this is a very important. The locking is much more important if not taken into account with appropriate standards. <laughs> the supply side, no thanks. <laughs> don't, don't mix up with uh, my business. I want to, to get uh, my customers forever. Uh, the demand side is woo, is difficult. Uh, when are we going to start with that? Uh, how do we start at all? And uh, there are plenty of involved parties. Uh, the industry, the government, all the standardization bodies, uh, official or industry driven that uh, you find around, plenty of issues. There are regulatory requirements uh, that we are still preparing. And uh, um, the fight uh, between the, the, the fora is important, like in any other uh, uh, kind of uh, approach uh, to standards. So good understanding, essential. This data migration issue is important, but at the same time, it's the basis for economics. If you look at uh, the cloud elasticity, what uh, global cloud providers are doing is uh, transferring the workload from one zone to the other as you go to Valley or to Peak. And this is the way they work. If uh, we are asking for non-data migration, that's going to have an influence on the price. No doubt about it, and we need to accept it if we want it. Uh, apart from that, uh, I mean, legislation is completely different at the European level, not to mention at worldwide level. So, um, we need to create a legal framework, and we are starting on that. What is at stake? I really recommend you, you are interested in, uh, in cloud computing and more particularly into the security area. I am a member of the management board of uh, an European agency called, called ENISA. That stands for European Network and Information Security Agency. The guys uh, have prepared a number of reports uh, that are public on the internet, uh, enisa.europa.eu. And uh, I really recommend them because uh, they are pretty good uh, on the challenges uh, on, uh, on, on the cloud for the government and for the citizens. We have uh, an informal group of uh, CIOs at the European level. And we meet back to back with uh, some of uh, the meetings of our, for our programs, uh, either the e-government group uh, at uh, European level or the ISA steering committee. So we ask uh, them uh, what do they think, uh, uh, how they would approach uh, the, the cloud. So at the time it was uh, March 2010, if I remember well, or April, 25% of the countries uh, had national strategies. Not too bad. 50% that are using already are for public services, and 43% are planning. Uh, and uh, you see the challenges uh, and the benefits are uh, pretty much in line with uh, the fears uh, <laughs> and the threats that were mentioned in John's uh, presentation. So nothing new the horizon. Everybody is uh, thinking and uh, pulling the hair. So if ever we have an European cloud strategy, we need to, to see the market, the legal framework, and the technical and commercial issues together. And this is the intersection, what is important on, on all that. So what are the ongoing uh, activities? So the data protection framework will be revised, uh, will be a proposal from the commission, the revision, before the end of the year. And this is a hot topic. If we fail there, we may either facilitate or we may uh, really uh, prevent the cloud from being a reality in Europe. We need to reform the standardization system and give a more voice uh, to the industry. And we need uh, to better use uh, those standards that are going to come in public procurement so that uh, we really make them uh, applicable. And of course, uh, issues are related to network security. There is a new regulation for ENISA that contains a fight against cybercrime. That is one of the issues uh, that uh, are uh, of, uh, of uh, the highest preoccupation for, for governments. And then, believe it or not, the European Commission, through the Research Framework Program, has been funding research on cloud already for the last three to four years. And uh, there is a lot. There you have a, a few of them, but I'm going to show you more and the amounts involved. You have two major programs uh, that are funding those kind of research. One is, as I said, the seventh uh, framework program for uh, research. 
on the calls for 2011-2012, uh, you have already uh, uh, calls uh, related to research called related to cloud, and also on the competitiveness and innovation program, we have already uh, already launched to the attention of our member states kind of cloud uh, projects uh, with 50% uh, part participation of European funding. We have a number of uh, challenges in the future. And as uh, of them, I'm going no, not going to repeat them because uh, this is uh, pretty much in line with uh, what uh, was uh, presented during the, the tutorial. So we have the Internet of Services and we have advanced software engineering that are going to contribute to the progress of the cloud. The cloud is at the beginning of the technology. We have virtualization, we have uh, elasticity, there are plenty of software paradigms, paradigms that are necessary in order to make uh, uh, the cloud something that is ideal for the services. And we have a number of support uh, actions, uh, of course. So those are, very quickly, some of the projects uh, that ha are being funded, uh, some of the projects. And you see uh, there that uh, if you count uh, the existing and the starting projects, uh, we are already funding with uh, more than 88 million euros. Kind of clown, cloud related uh, research, including, of course, what is essential in the cloud, uh, service oriented architecture. So, if you want uh, more information, you can go to the different websites uh, of all the projects, and there is a uh, full of, uh, of uh, documents uh, and, uh, and ideas, and um, some of them are really pretty, pretty interesting. So, what you have to take away of, uh, from uh, this uh, European uh, approach or landscape is that uh, it's changing the ICT market, no doubt about it. <laughs> We need to, to become cloud friendly or, uh, or cl and cloud ac active if we re really want to, to play it at the European level uh, kind of role into the globalization. We need to have uh, international uh, policies uh, needed, not only in Europe, but also uh, elsewhere. And uh, we are working on the regulatory framework uh, and uh, our plan for the time being is uh, to try and present uh, uh, a strategy for the cloud in February. In the meantime, DG Information Society, the Director General for Information Society, launched a public consultation that has been pretty successful. About 600 replies, some of them very extensive, to the consultation. We are now analyzing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the replies and we are going to come up uh, with some kind of report uh, with the summary of uh, what we found there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Am I on? Thank you very much. Okay, so Yuri, oh, I think I'm you're sorry. next. Sorry. Wonderful timekeeping too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In the following minutes, I will try to present you the initiatives of uh, our government for modernization of our uh, infrastructure. And since we are talking today about cloud computing, we have this technology at the heart of, uh, of, of our uh, environment, of our infrastructure. But first of all, let me satisfy the curiosity of some of you uh, regarding where Moldova is <coughs> and uh, uh, what infrastructure it has is it ready for the cloud computing at all or not? So Moldova is a very small country at the southeast of Europe, and we are neighboring with uh, Ukraine, and we are neighboring with uh, Romania. Uh, the area is uh, 33,000 uh, square kilometers, and the population is about 3.5 million. So it's, uh, as I said, it's a small country, uh, but we have uh, quite good achievements in wiring the country. We have a uh, fiber network connection to each of the locality of our, uh, of our country, and the internet penetration is moderate, is 42%. Uh, At the same time, the mobile penetration is quite high. The last month it was about 92%. So we have, uh, as any of our any of governments of your countries as well, we have some objectives which derive from our country development program. And our government set up different objectives related, uh, deriving from a social context, uh, from political context, 
and we try to map the ICT uh, power and the ICT uh, potential to these objectives. Some of them are um, related to Euro uh, European Union integration, some of them are related to a better governance, but some of them are related to make the life of our citizens more comfortable, more efficient. And this means develop, uh, developing and um, uh, putting in place a set of services which will make it possible for the uh, citizens to be served from their offices, from their homes, and not going to a, um, a physical context. So, starting from these generic objectives, we developed a strategic program which states the, that by the 2020 we have to have all e-services implemented and all physical services have to have their electronic counterpart. So, in this time frame, we'll have to deliver almost yearly 10 to 12 services and at the same time we'll have to digitize the back offices as being a, one of the precondition of, of delivering these services. Again, seven to eight um, back offices digitized earlier. And we hope by that time we'll have a 50% uh, or more adoption of, uh, of electronic services. So this is how we want to change our service delivery model. So this is how we want to change the life of, uh, of our system, uh, citizens. In this context, we elaborated a quite complex service delivery model. We are still working on improving it, which will contain how exactly and what kind of services we will put in place first, uh, how we identify them, how we plan for them, how we budget them, and so on and so forth. As well, we um, intended to develop a service maturity model, which will um, have a, w will allow us to have a picture of our e-services landscape, which of them are informational, which of them are more advanced, um, transactional, interactional, or even integrated. All good. Do we have the right platform to host these services? And the answer for Moldova, for now, is no. And that's why we started to think on the, uh, that modernized platform. We started to look at the technologies we have now, and from John's presentation earlier, uh, we found that from those assessments, we found that there is a, uh, a lot of potential regarding involving ICT and cloud computing in our, our case. What we want from this new platform? First of all, we want it to be modern. We don't want to stick to technologies of the 20th century, since we are in the 21st. We want it to be cost efficient, as well as modular, to be possible to reuse and to, to uh, apply whatever um, uh, changes we want to apply seamlessly. We want it to be simple, to increase the adoption, at the same time to be accessible, to allow citizens for, through different means to ac access services hosted in this platform. Also, we want to promote reuse, since this uh, uh, goes directly, relates directly to the spe uh, public expenditures, and uh, we want to save public money at the same time. And our answer to these challenges and to these principles is mCloud. So John mentioned mCloud stands for Moldova Cloud. And this is literally transposing this to the cloud computing um, uh, terminology. This is a private cloud. This is a government private cloud, which will be uh, um, uh, serving, first of all, all cloud, common cloud services, such as infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, uh, software as a service. At the same time, a lot of business services will be hosted there, and uh, this will be, in fact, the first choice for hosting e-services for both for uh, citizens and the um, and, uh, government itself. Why cloud computing? Cloud computing is on the agenda of each chief information officer, on the agenda of each chief technology officer, chief security officer, officer chief financial officer after all. So it's because of, it's not so much of technical innovations and changes it brings to you, but it's how the services get delivered. And this is, is exact response to our, um, um, well, for us looking for, for efficiency and security and improvements in, in service delivery. So uh, I will skip this uh, 
theory, I guess, for, for now, but this means uh, this uh, diagram reflects how complex is this uh, different layers of the cloud computing. So this is theory, but this is what we want to implement in practice. And from this, uh, from this diagram, you will um, see easily what we want to put in place at the infrastructure layer, what we envision as, uh, as being our platform as, as a service layer, and what we want to host at the software as a service layer. So first of all, we identify several services. So we have a set of sectorial services which will be developed by each particular service of the economy, uh, sector of the economy. We are talking about health services, social protection services, education services, police services, and so on and so forth. The second group of services is the services which aims to make the government more efficient. So this is the, pri the primary users of these services will be public officers in the government. Uh, since we, have, we are talking here about document and record management system, about business intelligence tool set for decision making, we are talking about a uh, geospatial, uh, geoinformational system which will allow us to map data, analytical data to some geographical locations and so on and so forth. So we have the third group of services which we call platform level services or common services which are elementary services used almost by any of the sectorial services. Here we have authentication access control, we have payment, since most of the services will, will be um, delivered uh, for a particular fee, and we have noti notification and, uh, and journaling. We want at the same time to bring with this new architecture some best practices from software development and from, from, from software architecture. Uh, we, uh, after this, uh, uh, this X-raying the, the services landscape, we identified that a lot of services are monolithic. In this case, you cannot extend them as, uh, as we want. So we, at least we want to adopt um, e-services reference architecture consisting of several layers. We want these uh, services to not stay isolated anymore. So they have to get integrated into a uh, um, interoperability framework. So from now, now on, each service will have to have the same functionality which is available for human users to have uh, this functionality available for, uh, through web services for different other f uh, applications willing to use the, th the first one. And at the same time, we want to keep our eyes on how we, we evolve and how we collect the data about our, our public sector. So we want each, uh, web, uh, which e each information system to have a set of monitoring APIs, ap application programming interface, which will allow us to automatically collect the data from business data from these information systems and reflect it onto a dashboard. So this is our view on, uh, on the interoperability framework, and here you may uh, notice the sectorial services, uh, shared services used across all ministries, the dashboard collecting and reflecting situation regarding the uh, business um, key performance indicators in the, in the public sector, the portal delivering these services. At the bottom, we have those elementary services or platform level services, and we have a mechanism of orchestrating all these uh, business services by creating complex business processes. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the typical interoperability uh, case, and it's, uh, it's quite similar with what uh, Estonia has. Uh, we uh, adjusted it a little bit to take uh, into consideration our, um, our circumstances, our reality. Uh, another innovation we want to bring with this new infrastructure is how we build platform level services like payment, like authentication access control. We want all of them to be developed using provider model, what we call provider model or a, um, an architectural pattern provider. So this means that uh, the same service could be delivered by different providers and let the citizen to choose what is the best service uh, what, what is the best provider for, uh, to, to be served in, uh, in a particular case? 
And this brings flexibility, this brings neutrality, since we are equally, um, uh, equally uh, distant from different providers. So this brings what is very important, cost efficiency, because different providers may compete on prices and on, on different level of quality. At the same time, it improves the maintainability availability of the system as a whole, because if one provider fails, still other providers remain functioning. So transposed to e-payment or to electronic payments, this would look like uh, something which is represented in this diagram. So this government e-payment gateway implemented as a provider, so you see the provider pattern here, is universal enough to accept payments from every service and to use every financial vehicle available on the market today. So this is uh, something citizens will like and the citizen will be that uh, authority which will decide which, what kind of, of payment method uh, uh, he or she will like to use in a in particular context. So we told you about why we need this, what we exactly need, and uh, now in a couple of uh, slides I will present how we want this to be implemented. So we see this uh, mCloud platform implemented in, uh, incrementally in several phases. In the first phase, the procurement we launched already uh, is um, intended to establish a um, platform w uh, where we will prototype every concept we have in mind today. At the later stage, we will extend our M cloud to a nationwide and full-scale cloud solution uh, with uh, data center consolidation uh, coming afterwards. So in the first phase, we want to use the same uh, facility we have today as a data center, and we will locate our cloud equipment in the same facility, and we will reuse the same data center inst infrastructure we have today. So it's not too much of, of capital investment in building and in, in, in building a separate data center for now. So it's a we will make sure that the entry point is, is quite, is quite accept affordable. But we would, what we want to prototype now is uh, all cloud-specific services, disaster recovery scenarios, uh, virtual desktop in, um, infrastructure uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, we want to connect local public authorities just to make sure that this is available for local authorities as well. We want to perform some exercises regarding data center consolidation at the same time. On the ne uh, next phase, the cloud phase two, which will start um, at the, in the middle of, of next year, we want to uh, extend the capacity of M cloud by adding new uh, hardware, new servers, new, new storage. At the same time, we want to build a brand new data center using a uh, public-private partnership model. We are partnering with some uh, mobile operators, uh, local mobile operators, to co-locate this uh, uh, new data center. And we are partnering with some of multinationals willing to um, make their presence in our region. So um, <coughs> after we put in place the, the M Cloud, we will start the data center consolidation exercise, which will give us the possibility to uh, reduce the number of uh, more than 100 data centers today to seven to 10 uh, high performance data center at, uh, at that particular time. One thing uh, I would like to, to, to mention how we see the transition to, to this new uh, uh, technology. Since this is quite new technology and it may um, uh, put some risks on, uh, on, on, on different institutions, on different teams, we want, uh, as a part of our procurement, we, we procured um, six months of managed services where the vendor, the solution provider, is in charge of every change made to the system. And we will back up our people, uh, so, so we will back up them with, with our people, so each of the cloud architect or cloud developer from vendor will have its own counterpart from, from our side. At a later stage, we, we asked for uh, another 30 months of uh, warranty period, and in this case, our people will be the main uh, uh, service operators. 
And after this period, business as usual, just our team working and, uh, and operating all, all the cloud services. We want to move to dump terminals or uh, virtual desktop uh, infrastructure. And uh, this is the last uh, initiative listed here. But this is not, uh, this is the technical part of, of things. Of course, there are uh, a lot of um, legislation adjustments and uh, improvements uh, going in parallel and the CloudFlex policy adoption and many, many other uh, interesting things. And uh, this is uh, the message I was willing to tell you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, that's great to see what's actually happening. Thank you. We can. The legal part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? So, so, yeah, if I could get my slides. Fantastic. And back to Estonia. All right, uh, my name is Mikkel Miedla. I work here in Tallinn, Estonia, uh, in a law firm called Soranen. Uh, I'm an attorney at law and I specialize in uh, IT law, uh, data protection and uh, electronic communications law. Uh, just a quick word about uh, Soranen. It's, it's, uh, it's the leading, le leading uh, law firm in the region um, we operate in four jurisdictions, which means we uh, we have a quite a, an extensive experience base working Did both with the private sector and the pro public sector, uh, advising uh, both of them, uh, but not in the same cases, of course. Um, and uh, today I, I was uh, asked to summarize some of the uh, uh, potential uh, legal issues uh, that are uh, related to uh, uh, governments using uh, cloud services. Um, what, what, what I'm uh, about to say is, is, is largely irrelevant uh, in case of uh, uh, private government clouds, as uh, Yuri was uh, telling. But this, this is more uh, relevant to uh, situations where, uh, where the pu public sector uh, wants, to, uh, wants to use uh, sort of like private sector providers for, for using cloud, uh, cloud services. And uh, the, the, the categories I, I want to briefly uh, touch upon, because I understand the time is rather limited, um, uh, are, are listed uh, as follows. Uh, first of all, uh, data privacy and security, uh, then uh, a little bit about contracts and liability, and then compliance. Compliance meaning uh, uh, what a public sector uh, authority uh, would have to take into consideration before using uh, cloud services. Um, and and uh, of course, uh, the purpose is, is, is uh, more to encourage a discussion rather than to uh, give an uh, exhaustive overview. Um, moving on, um, first of all, the, the big question uh, that always uh, pops up is, is uh, has to do with data location and ownership. Because uh, uh, once data is in the cloud, it, it, uh, it does not uh, recognize the state borders. Uh, which, which uh, engineers think is a, is a good thing, uh, lawyers uh, tend not to agree yet. Um, uh, and, and, and the practical uh, issues uh, that, uh, that, that and the questions that come to mind are, is, is of course, uh, in, in which country is, is the data stored, who, who has access to it, and then this all boils down to actually the issue of jurisdiction and then also perhaps some uh, national security interests, which, uh, which in our issue I don't want to go into details there. But, um, but why is jurisdiction important is, um, uh, first of all, whenever you, data is pushed in, in, into a foreign jurisdiction, uh, mm -hmm. the, the requirements of that jurisdiction will have to be taken into account. Uh, and uh, nowhere is it is it more visible, for example, than in in uh, intellectual property. What happens to uh, intellectual property that you are putting on the cloud? Uh, is the uh, host state uh, uh, does it have a clear enough legal framework to protect that data? Uh, your works. Uh, what happens to uh, new intellectual property that is created within the cloud that is hosted in in another jurisdiction? Will, it, will, it, will you be owning the, that data or, or, or uh, will it become co-owned with the uh, 
uh, state X. Uh, these are these are just uh, some of the, the questions that uh, that should be considered. Um, uh, right now, especially uh, bringing Estonia as an example, and and uh, of course uh, the European Union, uh, we have a quite quite a severe issue with uh, with cross border data transfers especially if, if uh, data is to be transferred outside of uh, uh, the european union or the uh, european economic area or, uh, or or to countries which do not have an adequate protection of, of uh, uh, adequate level of protection of personal uh, da adequate levels of personal data protection i'm sorry and um well, why, 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 why is this uh, important? Is, is, is currently uh, the, the process is very difficult in, in getting, for example, acceptance from uh, from uh, national data protection authorities to to get authorizations to to transfer personal data out of, out of the jurisdiction, and um, and and, and uh, the problem comes even more complicated because even in a closed system like the European Union, uh, each uh, member state has implemented the the directive differently and and uh, you will be it will be a nightmare if you have a you, you you're offering the services in Estonia you have the data center the primary data center in the UK and you maybe have some uh, redundancy uh, servers in in France so uh, you you're uh, quickly faced with several jurisdictions and and uh, all of these issues that are uh, that are uh, quite complex and then do not do not have a uniform answer um, and of course, uh, whenever you are the data controller as the state, uh, you'd have to ensure that, that your service provider uh, meets the same uh, requirements that, that you have to meet. Um, so moving along, um, a little bit uh, on the contracts and liability. This is just a sample, a sample list of, of uh, possible issues that, that, uh, uh, that you'd have to cover in, in a contract uh, where you uh, want to uh, procure services from from cloud providers um, what I want to highlight here is is um, is two things um, uh, one that should be considered is is uh, data handling uh, when uh, when your service provi provider goes bankrupt what what will happen to the data you'd have to ensure that uh, you'll be able to uh, Get your data out. That that uh, that your data and your IP doesn't uh, form bar part of the bankruptcy estate. Uh, issues like that. Uh, and uh, always, uh, you need to have an exit strategy, or uh, or you need to have the data portable. In other words. Um, um, moving on to the more difficult questions. Uh, and and uh, uh, what, what I would see is uh, as as uh, as the primary questions. Uh, first of all, is is the liability issues. Um, the the service provider, the cloud service providers, will uh, almost always want to uh, limit or even exclude their liability. Whereas uh, uh, you, as the client, uh, want want the liability of the service provider to be as high as possible. Um, We've heard of examples, for example, in the, I guess it was the city of LA who uh, contracted with Google, and and uh, in an unprecedented uh, uh, case, uh, managed to uh, obtain uh, uncapped liability from Google, which uh, which uh, which makes the decision making on on part of the government much easier. So if, if your service provider accepts uh, accepts uh, uncapped liability, you're in a much uh, better position. Uh, How do you apply it? Hmm? No, no. Hmm. Sorry? No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Sorry. I work for a minute. And, um, uh, and the other issue you'd have to follow is, is, the, is uh, your own liabilities. So some of the uh, service providers will, will almost certainly, hmm? uh, besides uh, you having to pay the bills, will put other obligations upon you. For example, making sure that uh, you have the right uh, legal basis to uh, to uh, process, for example, the private data that, that you put in the cloud. Uh, a very important question is, uh, and, and needs to be determined, that who is your actual service provider? Because uh, in the market there are, there are a lot of like mid-players, mid uh, 
persons who intermediate the cloud services and are building their own value-added services on, on, on the, for example, the inf infrastructure they're buying from Google. What, 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 uh, what is there to, for example, on the next day, switch uh, to another service provider located, for example, in China, who offers the, them a better price? Uh, you, as the uh, end client, do not have any right uh, to say to, to your service provider what kind of infra infrastructure he can use. So. Um, a couple of solutions here is is is, uh, is to uh, sort of ask ask the uh, the final cloud provider to join in on on the contract, or or again uh, be be very specific uh, uh, on the locations where the data may be hosted, and uh, uh, and also make the uh, service provider clearly liable for for any mistakes or or uh, shortfalls that that the cloud provider uh, has made. And. Uh, we come to the classic, uh, really difficult point with uh, with any civil contract uh, is is the, the enforceability. For example, uh, uh, the services are provided uh, in Estonia, but uh, you know there there obviously can and will happen some problems. Uh, it will be very expensive to go to courts in California and and have this uh, judgment or arbitral award uh, recognized here and and. Uh, not mentioning that it takes a lot of time, it's it's very expensive. Um, and uh, as as the third block, uh, quickly moving uh, through these is um, uh, as as a as a government agency uh, buying cloud services, uh, you'd have to be compliant uh, with with the legal framework that that is set upon you. Uh, for example, uh, these are just a few highlights: uh, the national rules for archiving. Uh, interoperability with other e-government services. For example, um, I believe Estonia has a rule that uh, uh, once uh, there is some data in, in the government databases, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, not nice or almost illegal to ask the citizens this information twice. So you, can, uh, uh, you need to make sure that you can recycle this data also in, 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 in some of the services you may have uh, cloud-based. Um, and um, um, one of the uh, the uh, more difficult issues is is uh, the requirements of public procurement, and uh, these uh, I, I believe are issues that uh, that uh, at least uh, on an European level w will at some point even uh, start uh, making it difficult for for uh, countries to implement uh, private government clouds. Because it restricts the market, and uh, you, you have to take uh, uh, into consideration uh, the competition rules, the freedom of uh, fr the the free movement of services, uh, and uh, and your tender documents must be uh, brilliant because it's it's very uh, difficult to change anything afterwards. Um, and uh, I guess in conclusion, what I wanted to say is is that uh, whenever uh, uh, you're planning to uh, uh, procure uh, cloud services, uh, you need to uh, chart all the legal risks, uh, give it full thought and analysis, and weigh these uh, risks uh, against the uh, benefits that can be achieved. So, thank you very much. Thank you. That's a fantastic checklist of um, <coughs> things to discuss there. Um, Okay, rather, I, I, I'm so tempted, so tempted to abuse my position as moderator and ask a question, uh, but I won't. I will resist later, it. Later, later, later. Yes, thank you. So, again, um, are we going to get another Austrian perspective? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah, another for those of you who were here this morning, obviously. Otherwise, this is completely fresh. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, I won't uh, tell you exactly the same things I talked um, about in the morning, so uh, not too much duplication. No, uh, in fact, I can be very brief because the, the advantage of being the last one in the row is that I can pick and choose those points uh, which had not been mentioned before. Uh, so I, I really uh, can save you the time for, for more discussion than afterwards. That would have... This is exactly the, the wrong 
<laughs> the, uh, I, I have a, another presentation. Otherwise, I, I do the same like in the morning, but that's that what you wanted to exclude. Are they going to find your... No? There, there is a second one on cloud. Then we have a longer discussion. I'm sorry. <laughs> does, does your cloud presentation contain any excellent yes. pictures and stuff? Attorney. Give them the, yeah. your... Uh, Hmm? Give them the, the, the USB. So I put uh, the USB stick there, and we have one yes. round of so questions in between. Huh? Okay, we could do that. So, uh, in in stark Let's contrast to this morning, I haven't received a, a welter of tweets. <laughs> so, uh, while we're waiting for Peter's Austrian experience to appear, and it will be fantastic and worthwhile, would. One or more people like to ask questions. For the, in fact, we can uh, move the whole panel, I think, to the, to the facing um, side of the chairs. Aha. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. So I've been um, listening with interest to, to the presentations. And one of the things that I've, I've been hearing, not just in the presentations, but as I speak with other people, at the conference, there seems to be at least an initial step, sort of maybe V1 to the cloud. Sounds a lot like private government cloud. I've, I've seen that come out in a few presentations. Mm -hmm. and, and my question is, I'm curious about how the, um, I had the one slide in my presentation yesterday that showed as you got to larger and larger aggregations of servers, the costs um, benefit the, the, the basically economies of scale dropping very rapidly. How does that additional cost savings play in? Do you think that private cloud is a first step for governments to get comfortable and then maybe public cloud will come? Or uh, I'm wondering if anybody has any ideas on that one. Yeah. No. Ah, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice that. Uh, Okay, so first of all, when uh, people uh, present uh, to me the cloud as the miracle for the economies of the future, I, I, I usually make uh, two reflections. Uh, first of all, despite uh, the, the, uh, the volume of uh, the, the infrastructure cost, if you look at, uh, in our case, uh, to the total cost of ownership of our application, still infrastructure is a uh, uh, it's, it's a very low per percentage of the to total cost of ownership. Mm -hmm. You develop, uh, you, you, you spend much more in development and more particularly in man maintenance for long-term projects. That's uh, one thing. So it's just to put uh, the amounts in, in context. Still, we need to reduce. But uh, in governments, uh, more particularly, just consolidating and uh, standardizing and eliminating you gain about 70% of the cost of the future cloud. And then you have the potential to do more. In my place, I had the, 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 the chance to, to run two services. One is a more policy-oriented, that is ISA program, that is concentrating on dialogue with member states about how we can better interoperate and, and, uh, and deploy cross-border services, and then running the internal IT. We have about 72 computer rooms. We have about uh, 3,000 servers. If I take uh, the number of users, 35,000, and I just brutally divide that by, by 3,000, means uh, that uh, every user, uh, every server will be serving 10 users. It's not like that that happens. I mean, there are potential for savings enormously. So this is uh, the, the, the first thing. So before going in a disorganized way to the cloud, it's uh, better to do your homework and then from there. And I believe that uh, one of the slides uh, that uh, you propose is in the same. So prepare yourself for, for the cloud. And use the cloud as an additional sourcing method. The legal issues that have been presented are very scary. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, why the hell you have uh, the, uh, the safe harbor, but uh, you have the Patriot Act. So people, are, I mean, uh, <laughs> governments are, are scared about that. And if you have a diversified legislation on how to protect, and then you know that uh, when the jurisdiction in, in your country, you are going to spend a lot of money, and you never know whether even with uncap kind of uh, liabilities <laughs> and you are going to succeed, that uh, means uh, that uh, prudency is uh, the first step. 
And uh, you guys, I, the, the security guys, you will never go to the cloud. That's uh, for sure, for sure. But there are opportunities uh, for the cloud. Simply, you need to select uh, your low-hanging fruits. For instance, in Spain, I heard that uh, the guys uh, that are in charge uh, of all the on the on the traffic, when they have a uh, snow, for instance, they cannot support that and uh, all the access on their servers. This is public information. Why don't you put that uh, into, into the cloud? There are plenty of sites uh, that are going to disseminate policy so in the European Union that have a lot of traffic uh, during uh, the, the peak uh, that is happening over the, the, the first uh, month, and then shh, goes away. So you have to use uh, the elasticity of the cloud uh, in the best uh, possible way for targeted uh, use. And uh, we, will we have a full public cloud uh, strategy in, uh, in, uh, in public administration? I don't think so. That will always be, in my opinion, hybrid. Look at any other kind of all government services and you will see that, uh, except in some uh, uh, countries that are taking that to the stream, the tradition of the bureaucratic uh, kind of approach to government in, in, uh, in uh, Europe means uh, that uh, you keep uh, a lot of tight control on the services uh, and you really completely outsource I mean the the the, the low uh, I mean the low value uh, kind of all services. Uh, this is uh, my view on that. Okay. Uh, I think what we might do is, if, if unless not, we might move to um, Peter's presentation on so cloud we move computing. Over there, so <laughs> no, you could. Uh, you, you can stay there. That would be fine. Okay, Peter. Kusner. Okay. Thanks. So I'll restrict myself to uh, only the, the points which are still missing that would have been the whole program, but I'm not doing that one. Uh, the general characteristics we, we heard uh, already and the definition, so I, I won't go into that. Um, f for me, one, one sentence is, is uh, crucial that uh, cloud computing uh, uh, itself, is, it's not a technology, but mainly a business model for providing IT services with, uh, of course, additional uh, considerations. Um, we see opportunities and risks uh, which are um, to be seen from the legal, structural, economical and technical side. The legal aspects, uh, most of them we, we already heard and I, I uh, can congratulate Mikkel for the, uh, for the overview before because it was a very, very uh, good overview on, on most of the crucial issues we have there. Uh, so for us it's, it's uh, quite clear that for a public cloud um, uh, personal data processing will not be the uh, uh, real uh, option to, to, to choose. Uh, uh, contractual adjustments uh, are um, almost impossible to, to uh, enforce there uh, for public cloud. Virtual private cloud uh, may be a bit uh, easier to go to for the pri private cloud. Uh, the conditions seem to be uh, best uh, ones to meet data protection requirements. Nonetheless, there are still uh, issues uh, you have to, to consider there. Uh, so for, for non-personal um, uh, data, and that's what Paco uh, uh, said right now, uh, there is no reason not to, to choose uh, cloud from, from, from this perspective, uh, so for public information. And so nonetheless, the contractual issues are there, the procurement issues are uh, still there, uh, because even, even if we talk about non-personal data and uh, public cloud, the question arises, um, how a real procurement uh, procedure may take place. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I'm, uh, if I release a tender, I'm not quite sure whether Amazon and Google really uh, uh, will approach me and uh, uh, what are the licensing uh, um, um, uh, behind that, models behind that, and, and all that retention issues. And, and uh, so we have lots of questions there. Um, uh, for the structural aspect, one, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, there is a certain risk, of course, of, of uh, creating a silo solution uh, by, by, by choosing uh, ad hoc uh, cloud computing uh, uh, model. Uh, and of course, the the exchange of data between application uh, b between applications uh, may be uh, quite uh, cumbersome. The economic aspects we we heard uh, 
most of them already. So there is uh, a shift between uh, uh, running costs and investment costs. Uh, technical aspects, standardization, I won't repeat that. We, we had that in, in much detail. Uh, scalability, uh, identity and rights management. Of course, uh, privileged user accounts, administrator accounts, uh, especially in, in the combination of cloud, uh, is a, a very sensitive issue. So, so the, the pure uh, user ID password managed uh, administrator for a cloud-based service uh, may, may raise uh, interesting questions. Um, patch management, technical revision and so on, so we, we had uh, some of those. I wanted to mention the, the question of e EID and cloud. So do we have something new there? Uh, as I said before, uh, it's, it's not an, a really new technology, but the combination and the scale and all those aspects before bring uh, uh, the, the, or may bring the breakthrough for this uh, cloud uh, uh, tendency. And the EID question is, uh, we have a real change in the basic assumption because we, we uh, in, in our minds, we, we have still a client-server uh, model based on end-to-end -end security and so on. So this is, a, this is not longer possible with cloud because there is a third player in between. There is client, cloud, server. And w with this, the, the whole assumption changes, which uh, then uh, uh, has legal consequences, contractual consequences, and so on. So this is uh, really the, the, the shift in paradigms we, we uh, face here. So for EID issues, cloud will be a specific uh, challenge um, uh, for, from all that. And the question is whether uh, crypto-based crypto technologies, security issues, will need uh, some rethinking uh, for, for cloud uh, issues. Just think about there is no physical uh, control by the user uh, on, on, on what's going on there and so on. So w what we, what we uh, think about in Austria is uh, to create um, cloud compatible uh, uh, applications and 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 uh, developments we 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 have there. Uh, for that, maybe both ends need some twist: the EID domain as well as the cloud uh, domain. For that, uh, the uh, how will we proceed in Austria? We now go into. Uh, piloting and analyzing cloud projects with a, on a smaller scale, so to say. So we are analyzing all the aspects, especially the legal aspects, organizational aspects, in very much detail. We had, since last year, a working group uh, looking in all the details, and now we are experimenting a little bit. What we set up here is, is an, an EID, single sign-on cloud, uh, service where we experiment on how to to assure there for for uh, uh, the rel for the for the adequate security issues and uh, personal data privacy uh, considerations. Uh, new applications we uh, develop should be developed in a way that they uh, would be uh, cloud ready, so to say. That is uh, the the way we would like to uh, go to. Uh, of course, we need uh, suitability criteria for the cloud itself, which model may fit into what kind of application, into what kind of uh, um, uh, implementation. Uh, and the cloud standards, uh, we talked about that before, of course, the European uh, uh, considerations are, are crucial here. Uh, well, that more or less closes uh, things we are testing, piloting, evaluating, uh, and we, we are quite, uh, quite confident that, that we can uh, exchange in a quite good uh, manner on, on the uh, 
uh, European considerations for the EU cloud strategy. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have time for a couple of questions. Well, at least one. Somebody from the audience. Cloud? EID? Shh. Okay, uh, my question is goes to uh, maybe head of uh, IT in EU. Um, okay. I think one of the characteristics of cloud computing is uh, consolidating the, all the, uh, the resources. Uh, I think uh, we have a good presentation from Moldova and also Austria and some other country cases, but uh, when you think of EU, uh, your big target is uh, make a single market, like a single country. Then, have you ever think about this cloud computing for EU uh, as a provision to many small countries in EU, which uh, is not enough budget, not enough capacity of uh, people like that? Okay, uh, probably because I didn't have the time, I didn't clarify a number of issues. Uh, so I am uh, just uh, to put uh, my position that uh, is uh, related to and the reply to the questions. Uh, so people uh, say to me, I'm the Director General of IT for the European Commission. So people say, ah, okay. So you run uh, the IT or you supervise the IT for uh, the member states in the European Commission. The answer is no. Then the next question is, ah, you supervise the uh, IT for all the European inst institutions? The answer is no. The good news is that uh, I work a lot uh, with member states uh, and I work a lot uh, with other institutions so that uh, we work in synergy. So this is the first part. So I don't have any power on anything related to consolidating at the European level any infrastructure. I don't even have the power in my institution, but I have the influence because I don't like power. I like credentials and influence. And I believe that with that, uh, you achieve much, much more than uh, in, in power, more particularly in public administration. So IT is uh, an exclusive competence of member states. So the EU doesn't have a lot to, to, to say, except if uh, any use of IT might represent a barrier to the development of the internal market. And it happens uh, sometimes uh, to be so, and that's why some of our major programs have the, I, the, 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 the development of the internal market as uh, the legal base. Governments are so big and uh, have such a capacity of purchasing that uh, if uh, they disrupt by electronic means uh, the free circulation of goods and services, they may put in danger the internal market. And this is only the only hook where we can say something to member states. So uh, there will be ever kind of uh, government cloud, even for a set of countries. Generally speaking, no. May, may it happen that for some specific systems, we, as an organization, the European Commission, may take over some of the systems, giving them, the, well, putting in place the appropriate governance and giving them the adequate quality of service. Yes, and I have a, a very recent example. There was uh, what we call the Kyoto database. The Kyoto database uh, was uh, to the change of uh, CO2 quotas, pollution quotas. These, uh, there were a uh, uh, distributed uh, kind of system where there were registries on every country and there was a central one in the European Commission and another one in the United Nations. It happened also a few months ago that uh, this uh, site was attacked and hacked with SQL injection. The result of the matter is that all the change of quotas was stopped. In the meantime, already member states said, why the hell we should develop uh, one system whereas uh, a central system could do better, faster, and be more secu secure? And we were planning for that. And now we are in the middle of the planning because uh, we are going to deliver this specific system that's going to connect uh, with the one in the, in the, in the United uh, Nations on the 1st of uh, January of uh, 2012. So, Punctually, it may happen that we run system on them, and whether we run it on the cloud, on our premises, it doesn't matter. This is just a sourcing mechanism. What is uh, important is what kind of guarantees and level of services we are going to give to member states for this specific system. So, for the general thing, no. For a number of things, yes. Great. Thank you. A 
comprehensive answer. Okay, we have time for another question. Oh. <laughs> d d d okay, okay, Steve. If no one else. No, I, I mean, I, I think after I ask this question, everybody's going to come beat me up because of my belaboring points about public cloud. But um, I, I'm doing this as much to sort of as a, a, a thought provoking exercise. Based on all of the discussion we've had about cloud here so far, when we start talking about public cloud, it seems like there's a fairly common reaction, which is, whoa, there are a bunch of, of privacy and sovereignty questions. Those are all really big. Somebody's got to go figure those out. Let's move on. And, and what I've heard that makes a lot of sense here today is the notion of, well, there's data so center consolidation. Your answer was, was, was really what I was looking for, which is there's a whole bunch of work that cloud can be a forcing function for, for data center consolidation. And my parting question really is around these privacy and sovereignty questions. And I'm, I'm curious if there aren't some that might just be things that we have to work out um, through um, you know, various ways of getting, uh, getting a better alignment of national laws, but others that we may just have to learn to be comfortable with. And on that, you, you know, you mentioned the Patriot Act. I was having dinner with some folks and I mentioned that, well, most countries actually have a terrorism-related um, mechanism for getting at pretty much any data. And so the, the, the Patriot Act, rather than being a, <coughs> sort of an exception, is kind of a rule. And, and so I wonder if, if we know that there's something like that in pretty much every jurisdiction, are, the, are some of those ones that we'll, will we get over them or never get over those? Is that potentially just a huge impediment to, to public cloud? You're all wearing it. Well, uh, I guess uh, okay, one, excuse me one, again. one of the, <laughs> no, I, I one, tend one to of the uh, potential solutions could be, and you're of course right that, that uh, each and every country has similar uh, acts uh, to combat uh, serious organized crime and, and whatnot, um, is, is uh, to use uh, very sophisticated encryption technologies, for example, to, uh, uh, to uh, at least secure some of this data. Um, some, some uh, personal data could be uh, pseudonymized in, in a way that, uh, that it, it is not personal data anymore, uh, at least while it's in the cloud and, and uh, uh, sort of like translated uh, backwards wh when it's back in, in, in the originating country. Uh, these are perhaps some of the, the solutions uh, technology-wise. From, uh, from the legal perspective, I, I guess uh, it's, it's quite certain that, that uh, the uh, counter-terrorism laws will, will not go anywhere. I, I just I wanted to add that, that um, again, this is a more a legal organizational issue than a technical issue. But, uh, but uh, the reality is uh, that uh, you need to, to carry out uh, some kind of risk analysis of all your information. And based on that, uh, I mean, the, the, the best way of not solving a problem is uh, trying to generalize and globalize the problem. So I like to approach uh, the problem on at least uh, we agree on what we agree, and uh, uh, we agree on what we disagree, and we, <laughs> we work on the disagreements. If we approach uh, that uh, this way, probably, probably, we are going to, to get openings uh, there. But the first thing we need in terms of, uh, because of privacy, more even than security as such, uh, privacy seems to be one of the main barriers. Uh, I, it was in that meeting I mentioned before uh, on the first week of, of, of September, and what uh, the Director General of uh, Information Society asked, uh, to the guys uh, in uh, injustice is uh, at least uh, <laughs> do not reject uh, the possibilities uh, 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 from the beginning. I mean, give us uh, some opening so that we can continue studying the, the, the thing. Of course, this is at the level of the European Commission. I wanted to, to also to destroy another myth, is that Brussels decide everything. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I didn't have the time to display a very interesting slide I have about uh, the, 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 uh, the, the EU policies and the competence. And if you look at uh, the competence <laughs> in the European Union, there are seven. The rest are shared competencies and a lot of uh, support actions. So at the end of the day, even if uh, we have some competences in this area, we have uh, very few. 
is a web member states and at the end of the day this is agreed by member states so even when we make the most convenient or friendly proposal to the cloud computing in terms of privacy still the parliament and the council that are representing the citizens and the member states may completely go the other way around and just uh, to add uh, the lisbon treaty was supposed to, to simplify the things well uh, I can tell you that and now the process will be longer and whatever kind of, uh, of uh, non-fast track initiative is going to take about two years. So, did I reply to your questions? Yes. You I did. <laughs> I, I would like to add one thing. I know we're running out of time, but my own question to John and to Peter, and also Mikkel as well, yeah. Because certainly, Peter, on your slide, when you came to the legal side of things, it was all minuses. And, and we almost had that from the legal perspective as well. And yet, I, you know, from what I've seen in the UK, we're getting, there's a lot, everything's changing. There's a lot more data. It's not just the existing personal data. We're getting a much richer data sets being, particularly in e-health, collected. And we can't afford to meet our, if we, want to, if we want to innovate like this, if we want to take the science forward, if we want to take the social innovation there, we can't afford to do it properly if we have to maintain it on little boxes underneath every scientist or epidemiologist or developer's desk. Yeah. So we actually, to some extent, need this. I mean, it, it, do you not think that we will be, as well as being frightened you know, by the legal implications, we will be driven by the legal implications of the new things that we're doing towards this? Or is that a naive view? Yeah. Well, to start with, with just a sentence, um, uh, uh, yes, there, there have been uh, quite a few minuses for the legal perspective. That might also have something to do uh, with my profession because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I'm, I'm not frightened uh, of the legal uh, issues, but uh, I really see that as, a, as a quite a challenge how to meet the proper requirements on the legal side and at the same time uh, reach what we are aiming at with uh, this uh, solution. And uh, the twist has to be on, on several sides. It might have to be on amending uh, the legal framework, but we have to, 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 um, to be aware of the fact that we still have very uh, different uh, legal traditions and cultures uh, within Europe itself and uh, of course in comparison with other mem with other uh, countries in the world and uh, I'm, I'm not quite convinced uh, what what has been said before that um, uh, all um, all uh, countries might have something like a Patriot Act and 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 things like that I th I don't think that uh, you you would be able to really compare those uh, counter-terrorism uh, legal frameworks uh, between all those states and I doubt whether you will find too many uh, EU countries really um, uh, having uh, the same standards and, and, and uh, levels we see on, on the US side. So that's one thing. The other thing is, yes, what have, has been said before by Mikkel, uh, things like pseudonymization, things like uh, cryptology and so on might uh, at the, the to to the level of security and might reduce therefore the risks for privacy and data protection might therefore be a solution or kind of solution uh, for for making it happen uh, cloud and uh, even personal data but we we really have to study that it's not that we say no uh, uh, stop uh, cloud thinking but it is here. Cloud is cloud is here, and it we we have to see that this is a way uh, to go to. So we have to find uh, appropriate answers uh, for those questions we we see right at the moment. Huh? Well, uh, I would like to approach this uh, or answer this uh, in, a, in a very philosophical way, because um, all in all, anything new is is. Um, uh, and how to deal with it. It boils down to uh, basically values uh, that the society uh, uh, under uh, consideration uh, holds, uh, holds there. 
and uh, whether it is uh, at some point uh, the the protection of the individual, uh, their privacy, or it is the progress of the society and uh, perhaps the, the public interests and, and innovation and uh, they, they, they are uh, with, with the cloud they are they are clearly moving in different directions so uh, it, it, it boils down to the values uh, which which are reflected in, in the laws so it, it takes time for for the uh, values to be uh, reflected in, in the laws to to meet up with the, with the with the way life is going I, 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 what I want to say mm -hmm. is it's just a question of time if, if, if the society's uh, values really have changed. John, final word? Real quick, uh, as an engineer, um, we think in two different ways. We think in, in one level that we want to be creative, all the things that we learned and we can dream about and put on a whiteboard. That's one way that engineers think. And the other way that engineers think is that we solve problems. And uh, what we want to know from regulators and what we want to know from governments or, or regional political bodies is what is your objective? Give us your objective and we will go out and design a solution that meets your requirements and uh, that's what engineers want to do and with cloud computing if you set a law, if you set a legal framework we will find a way to develop the technology to fall within that framework. Maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> Maybe you should drive progress. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you. That philosophy can continue through the coffee break and right into the, um, into the pirate party, actually, um, at 4.30. So, open government at 4.30, clearly. Enjoy your coffee. Thanks very, very much to the presenters. Thank you.